Well, good morning, Southside. Um, special Lord's Day, we're going to partake of communion together at the close of our service. So what a privilege to gather together and remember the sacrificial death of Christ, our blessed hope of glory. Uh, at the close of the service, I wanted to mention in Classroom Z, we're going to be having a meeting for anyone interested in a new ministry. Uh, we're looking to start up. It's really just kind of a, a, an interest meeting um, in helping with special needs uh, children uh, in our church family. And so if you'd be interested in that, learning about it, serving in it at all, uh, uh, Classroom Z right through here. Uh, and we're going to do it right at the close of the service. So if you could come out and meet us there, that would be excellent. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer and ask him to meet us in a sweet way at the table. Father, we come before you and we continue our worship now with the declared word of God. You have inspired, you have um, given us this word. It's perfect, it's the, the mind of God. And so we thank you for it, that it's, it's without error, it's inerrant. And I ask now that you would just take it and illuminate it to every mind and heart. Lord, to behold the words of God, what a treasure. And what is manifested in those words that we look at this morning should overwhelm every heart to, that we have a God who saves. We have a God who is good, sovereign, and merciful. God, we thank you for these glorious truths. And I just pray now that you meet us in a, a mighty way as we uh, begin to look at them and seek to understand them by your grace. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. All right, I forgot to fix the pulpit. Yeah, okay. If it flies over, it's coming on you, brother. Okay, you catch it. Oh, I like it. So look with me in Romans 10. Kind of our broad outline is Paul's uh, revealing his heart towards the, to the unbelieving Jews and to the nations with this gospel. And he begins after, oh, that's beautiful. I was going to ask, is there anyone who could fix this, but I didn't want to put pressure. You know what? That's better. You got anything else in that aisle? Okay, we'll, we'll go. We'll go. So in verse 1, after the sovereignty of God and all that he's doing uh, with the nation of Israel and taking the gospel to the nations, Paul breaks into this prayer. Uh, brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for my kinsmen, the Jews, uh, is their salvation. And then he shares the problem in verse 2 that they have a zeal for God, but it, it's not in accordance with knowledge, this epinosis, this full knowledge of, of God, where you really understand this gospel. And what they're not understanding in verse 3 is not knowing about a God kind of righteousness, the perfection that God requires of his people. And what they did then by not understanding God's righteousness and their own unrighteousness, they, th they sought to establish their own by going to the law and working out goodness from themselves to get God's acceptance. And so they would not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. And we looked then at the, the provision. For Christ is the end of the law for that kind of righteousness to everyone who believes. We, we, we trace this whole law and it finishes at Jesus Christ who came and, and fulfilled the law, kept it, died in our place for all our transgressions of that law. And now in verses 5 through 13, we start looking at the, the product, which is to be saved, that, that this salvation now goes out to all. Last week, Paul kind of personified two concepts as if they were speaking. And in verse 5, he speaks uh, legalism. For Moses writes to the man who practices the righteousness, which is based on law, he shall live by that righteousness. If you want to get right with God through law, then you keep it perfectly. It demands a perfection. You want to come under that? Keep it perfect. And then he comes in verses 6 through 8. It says righteousness, though, speaks something different. It's based on the, the faith. It says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That's to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss. That's to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. 
which we are preaching, and we looked last week at this beautiful fulfillment of the law in Christ, and it's come near, and it's come near to us as close as, as our minds, our hearts, and our tongues, and it came as close as God leaving glory and coming into this world to fulfill that law and bring about redemption. So this morning, then, we're going to continue. Back in verse 8, he says that word of faith which we are preaching. And then in verse 9, that, that if you confess, that now as we turn to that focus this morning, that little that is the content of what we preach. It is the content of the gospel then that we will go proclaim. And so let's look at what is the gospel then that we're to believe, that we're preaching, that we're speaking. And Paul in one verse is just going to show us the beauty of the gospel. So if you've ever said, what's the gospel? Uh, Welcome to Southside this morning. We're just going to unpack God's gospel. Look with me. uh, Let me read verses 9 through 10. Do, Do we have those? I can't remember what I gave you. Verse 9, I just, in the dark, I like to put the verses up now. <clears throat> We're working hard to get light, so I, I just want you to know that this may not be forever. Uh, my vote is forever, but I, I, I don't know where we'll go with it. But verse 9 is that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So here's our outline this morning, is the content of saving faith. Jesus is Lord, God raised him from the dead. And then our second point is the character of saving faith. It's with the heart that we believe. And then thirdly, the confession of saving faith is we confess then with our mouth. It's out of the fullness of the heart that that we speak. And we will look at all three of those this morning. So just start with me in verse 9, the content of saving faith. Verse 9 starts with what's in the Greek. It's called a subjunctive. And a subjunctive is potential action. So here's the potential action. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, here's the potential. You will be saved in the future tense. So the, the subjunctive, if you do those, you will be saved in the future. So it's, it's bringing about this salvation on the last day that's coming for the believer. When I stand before God on that last day, I will be saved. And so one interpretive note as we begin, the language now in verse 9 shifts from the third person to now the second person, you. And so now we're going to kind of come at you this morning and begin to apply what we've been studying and looking at for the last few weeks. You must believe it. It's not enough to to just think about it and say, I like that. Paul's going to drive this morning. You, you must believe. This is the application of 10 chapters of Romans. This is the the bottom line. I had this buddy at seminary. uh, They used to drive the teachers crazy. They'd be teaching and pouring out their heart, and he'd raise his hand and go, is this going to be on the test? And the professors would just be like, oh, And so he got nicknamed, his name's Bill, and it was Bottom Line Bill. (laughs) Here's the bottom line. Is this going to be like, yes, the bottom line this morning, you must believe. This is for you. You must respond to this gospel. We're done hearing about it and understanding it. There's a response to this gospel. Make up your mind time uh, this morning. What am I going to do with this gospel of Jesus Christ? Let's take a look at it. Bottom line. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And as I begin this morning, the first thing that hit me is, doesn't believe in your heart come first? Out of the heart, Jesus said, the mouth speaks. Yes. And in fact, in verse 10, he flips it back to to it's you believe and then you speak. And so I think what Paul's doing is he's just following in verse 8, the Deuteronomy 30 passage. And in that passage, it's not a theological order, but it's just the order of how it was put in Deuteronomy. And so it's just showing the, the nearness of the gospel, the nearness of your mouth and the nearness of your heart. But Paul's going to kind of move it in, in the next verse to the theological part that you believe first, and then that is what will come out of your mouth. So let's take a look at it in verse 9. If you confess. The Greek word is homo legeo. Homo means the same. Legeo means logic. 
And so if you are of the same logic, if you're in agreement with God that Jesus Christ is Lord, I'm going to confess, I'm in agreement, Jesus is Lord. And the word carries the idea that it works its way out into speech. I'm in agreement and I speak, I, I proclaim. And so this just blows out of the water in our day and age. People say, all you have to do is say, Jesus is Lord, and you're going to heaven. This word and idea is so much bigger than that. That, That's what we call heresy. The gospel is not just running your mouth. It's not just a mental ascent. It's epigenosis that we've been learning. It's that full knowledge of the gospel, and Paul is now going to flush out what is epigenosis. And it's not just going, Jesus is Lord. It's not just mentally assenting to these things. This is the knowledge that gets into your heart, and you see the fullness of this gospel. And that's what we're going to look at. And so if you're just dead, external, nodding, saying words, I'm after you this morning. This gospel, it's got to get into your heart. And Paul's going to say, epignosis, it breaks external stuff and it comes into the heart of a believer and makes it new. And that's what we're going to look at. So this is the heart that perceives and understands who Jesus Christ is. It's life-changing. It causes you to be born again. I think of Paul, if it's just mental ascent. Here's Paul going to kill Christians. Anyone who names the name of Jesus and calls him Lord, uh, I'm going to kill him. I want to put him in prison, put him to death. And on that road, he gets that vision of that marvelous, beautiful light, which was the glory of Christ. And Paul is knocked off his horse, and he says, Who are thou, Lord? And he says, Yes, it's, it's Jesus whom you persecute. And he says, Why do you kick against the goads? And that phrase meant to resist deity in that day. Why are you resisting deity? And then in Acts 9.20, it says, immediately Paul began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he's the son of God. And so that's epigenosis. That's what happens when you realize who Jesus is. What happened to Paul was not mental ascent, but epigenosis. And he now knew in his heart, Jesus is God. And he went and proclaimed it everywhere. Or before, if you said Jesus was God, he wanted to kill you. What happened? God opened his eyes to see the glory of Christ. And so we must confess that Jesus is Lord. And it's not just some cliche. It's not uh, the password. Uh, This is the core of saving faith. The word is kurios. And in the Septuagint, the the translation of the Old Testament in Greek, this word is used uh, for Jehovah, the, the name of God. And it's used over 6,000 times. And they knowingly give this title to Jesus, Kurios. And I just want to read a few verses to you this morning. Luke 2, 11, The angels come and they announce to the shepherds, For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Isaiah 9, A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, a virgin's going to conceive, and, her, and, and this kid will be called Emmanuel. God is with us. And you remember when we began Romans 1 2? This gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, and he was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul uses Lord 44 times in Romans and 30 cases it was used of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Go ahead and write down Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.15-16, 1, Philippians 2.5-10. I just want you to go look and stare in the Scriptures that Jesus is Lord. He's our our Lord. And salvation is we get epigenosis and we believe in our heart that He's Lord and we confess it to a dying world and we offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to kurios. Rule my life, Christ. Be my king. 
your Lord. And Paul is saying this is the essence of saving faith. This is not something you, you come to see later. This is who Jesus is. He says, come to me. Where is he? Seated in complete victory with all authority on heaven and earth, on a, on a reign above all, and take my yoke upon you. Put it upon you and come follow after me. Today we're told you don't need to repent, you don't need to surrender, you don't need to change life. You just need to mentally assent to these truths. And I'm telling you, this has done so much harm to the body of Christ in America and to our own hearts. I sense that they want to preserve the gospel, um, it's faith and not by works. And I've labored for three years to preserve that doctrine. We bring nothing to Christ. We come as a sinner to be rid of all of our sin. We come empty-handed with nothing to bring simply to thy cross. We cling. But don't mistake that for what happens at salvation. You're regenerated and your eyes are opened as Paul's were. And you see the resurrected Christ and that you've been living opposed to him. We're under condemnation. There's nothing we can do to change it. We see a crucified Savior now with epignosis, and we fall on Him and we surrender to Christ, and we're justified by believing. Our hearts are made new. They're melted now by the love of Christ, and what was once enmity is mutual love, and you're joined to Him in union. And grace now writes the law upon your hearts from the inside, and he will conform us to that image as we saw in Romans 8. He will, he will bring us to glory and he will be changing and transforming us. That is not mixing the purity of justification by faith in Christ alone. It just shows that faith will not be alone. It will take over your heart and it will cry that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. If you get the heart, you get the whole person. And so, brethren, Jesus did not call people to just mentally assent, but to follow him, to take up your cross and follow after Christ. A.W. Tozer, the great theologian, said this. He said, years ago, no one would ever dare to rise in a meeting and say, I'm a Christian, if he had not surrendered his whole being to God and had taken Jesus Christ as his Lord as well as his Savior and had brought himself under obedience to the will of the Lord. It was only then that he could say, I am saved. Today we let them say they're saved no matter how imperfect and incomplete that transaction with the provision that the deeper Christian life can be tacked on at some time in the future. Can it be that we really think we do not owe Jesus our obedience? This is a bad teaching, brethren, says Tozer. There was a man when I was at seminary, they called him the Duke. He was in Ukraine and he started many churches in the Evangelical Baptist Fellowship, and he was very close to Pastor John MacArthur. And when I was out at seminary, he came. And he was given a copy of John's book called The Gospel According to Jesus that was written about his lordship. And it was translated into Russian. And the man, the duke, said, that is a good work, but why did you write it? And, and Rob Provost said, well, it, 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 he explained that in America, you can accept him as a savior, but not as Lord. And the Duke said, they believe that? <laughs> the first part of the content of the gospel of saving faith confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. <clears throat> Where's his death and all that? I resolve to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. Well, it's right here in this passage. We see that Christ had His face set to Jerusalem. He came to die. He told His disciples often, I'm going to be killed and delivered up. I came to give my life as a ransom for many. I'm the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. On the tree, He cried out, it's finished. I've accomplished salvation. And Christ told us what this was all about. I finished it. I kept the law in regards to righteousness, and I've atoned for sin. I propitiated the wrath of God on the cross. I've made a way for sinners now to be saved. And so if Christ is not raised, we're still in our sins. But if he is, the resurrection is God's billboard. It's his statement, I've accepted the atonement of Jesus Christ. It has paid for sin. It has accomplished salvation. I've torn the veil in two because it's brought full access now back to me 
through the work of Jesus Christ. It's finished. I'm satisfied. Resurrection declares it. There's salvation in no other name and then Jesus Christ in which a man can be saved. And so now I can lay it all on the line and I don't need to doubt, waver, or question. There is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe this in my heart and he's Lord. Amen. Romans 4.25, he was delivered up because of our transgressions and he was raised because of our justification. So sin... Wrath, atonement, righteousness, resurrection, lordship, it's all a part of the gospel. And so it has to just be bigger than mental assent. We have altar calls all the time and the gospel's not even preached. What are people responding to? It's not just believe uh, something we, we, we must, uh, uh, it's, it's what we're believing in that matters. What we confess and what we believe in our heart, there's content to the Christian gospel and we've spent three years looking at the content of this gospel. And so faith is not emptying your head and just believing something. Faith is as only as good as what it's resting in. Faith and faith is... He's been raised from the dead. We don't serve a dead Christ. We serve a living Savior, a living King. He, he, he lives to lead us, to bless us, to strengthen us, help us, give us righteousness, wisdom, sanctification. That's the joy of the gospel, faith in Christ. And that's why Polycarp said, I will rather die than say Caesar is Lord because Jesus is Lord. People, there are too many clamoring around the cross of Christ, said Osgenes, and few who want to carry it. I have no comfort or gospel for one who's just mentally assented to this. This is epinosis. And this is what Paul has been laboring and writing and showing us for years. The content of saving faith, to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead as an atonement for sin. Let's look at our second point. That's the content. Now I want to turn to the character of saving faith. <clears throat> We've touched on it, but I want to go further. At first, he says, you need to believe in your heart. Cardia, the heart is your feelings, the center of your personality, your innermost person, your whole personality, the wholeness of your being. One, one minute, it's the totality of what we are. It's your mind, affections, and will, your, your heart. And Christianity is the heart religion. That's what this is. It's about the heart. It can't be imitated, it can't be put on, it can't be external. It's the heart. The way that God has made us from the heart will flow the issues of life. It's all about the heart. And the key to this section is unbelief. Unbelief is not merely a matter of, of not understanding. All we got to do is go around and educate people and we'll change the world. It's a matter of the heart. Romans 1.18, they, they suppress the truth. They, they won't have it. Their hearts say, I don't want this God that I see in creation. And 121, it says their whole person would not glorify God. We know there's a God, and this all points to him, but I will not give him thanks or give him praise. Romans 8.7, I'm at enmity with God in my very heart. Romans 14, or Psalm 14.1, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. I resist him. Jesus said at that time, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things, the gospel, from the wise and the intelligent, and you did reveal them to babes. You gave epigenosis to babes, and the smart and the wise can't figure it out because it's a hard issue. John 3.19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. <clears throat> Men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. It's so much deeper than just the intellect or we could just give instruction and people can be saved. The seat of unbelief is the heart. And in 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul said, A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. And he can't understand them because they're spiritually appraised. They can't get epinosis. They, they can't see this. They can't figure it out. They can't, the Spirit's got to reveal it. Unbelief is the condition of the heart of man. 
So it can't be just give your mental assent to doctrine. It can't be just confess intellectually Jesus is Lord. And it can't just be I agree. There's something so deeply opposed to Jesus Christ and the Father and the Spirit within us, within our hearts, uh, that we can't overcome its enmity. There's no power on earth that can overcome it. Only the power of God. Unless you're born again, you, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Ezekiel said this. God said in Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. I'm going to take away your issue and I'm going to take out that stony heart that will never submit to Christ and see his glory and his beauty. It's at enmity. I'll take it out and I'll give you a new one that loves me and says Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead. Acts 16, 14, there was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She's selling purple fabrics, a worshiper of God. She's listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. It's a hard issue. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, to give you epinosis. Jesus, shine forth, see his glory, see his beauty. And so the call here in Romans is believe the gospel with your heart. It, it, it must enter into the heart. It must get into the whole person, the core of your being, believes God raised him from the dead and accomplished salvation. That's broken into my heart. It, it, it is my identity. It's what drives me. The, the only thing that can explain my life is Jesus has been risen from the dead. It got in. It broke into my heart. I'm not a dead dog sitting here looking at Jesus Christ saying, who cares? I'm going to live any way I want. I'm going to do whatever I feel. But I said, Jesus is Lord. That's going to kill you. That's going to damn you. I pray. I pray this breaks in. When it gets in that heart, you're a new creation. And so the content of saving faith, Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead. The character of saving faith, it's with the heart that we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. And now the third point is the proof of saving faith is the confession of the mouth. It's out of the fullness of the heart that we speak. And so there will be words that come out. Heart belief in these truths will bring a confession before men. You will, un, you will be unreservedly given to Jesus Christ. You, know, you Catch this, there are no secret disciples. You'll, lo you'll lose your life in this world so that you might gain it. Spurgeon said, I preach to you an open king's highway, along with the fearful and the unbelieving refuses to go. And yet there's only this one way into the kingdom. We must not attempt to be moonlighters. Let us follow Jesus in broad daylight. Quit hiding and, and, and come out. When you get this in your heart, you've got to speak. And you've got to enter into a world that right now our country hates this gospel. And it's, you speak, you finally are going to get persecuted. And there's a lot of ways to hide and be secret disciples and not say these things. This is going to speak when it gets into the heart. This gospel is a call to vocally own and confess Jesus Christ. You're to say with your tongue and your mouth and your lips, He is my Lord and Savior. I'm, I'm for Christ, and I'm His follower. I'll follow this Christ. You stand up to the world and you say, I have decided to follow Jesus Though none go with me, still I will follow. The world behind me, the cross before me. That is an essential part of saving faith. It gets in the heart, and the heart has to speak about what it loves and treasures and sees and delights. Well, Hebrews eleven thirteen. all these in the hall of fame of faith, they died in faith, 
without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. Paul said to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Heart belief results in agreement and verbal confession. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord. What fills my heart will fill my mouth. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And that's what epigenosis does. And so Paul is saying to say it from the heart will only come by the Holy Spirit. Confession of the mouth is the proof of saving faith. The Puritan Thomas Hooker said, if a man has faith within, it will break forth at the mouth. True heartfelt belief will give expression of itself. If we get Romans 1 through 8, we'll give expression to it. When Romans 10, 4 becomes epinosis, you'll speak. You'll own him. You'll proclaim him. He is what fills my heart and my speech. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome is where this gospel began. In Acts 4.19, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you or, or rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking what we've seen and heard. Quit preaching Jesus. We can't. Put us in jail. Kill us. We can't. I love 2 Corinthians 4.13, but having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore also we speak, said Paul, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God of God. And then he says in the next chapter, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, if I, if, or if I preach the gospel, I have nothing, nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. We can't remain silent. Jesus said, Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I'll confess him before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And so we will struggle. There'll be times we'll be afraid. There's going to be battles. But when this gets in the heart, it's going to come out. And Jesus is my Lord. That's what baptism is declaring. And it just will speak, and it will speak of him, and it will stand up against this world and tell truth and get this gospel out. That's what happens. And here's why this is so important. It says, the one who does this, in verse 9, uh, you will be saved. It's in the future tense. Glory, glorification. The one who gets this, and it gets into his heart, and he believes and he confesses, he realizes, I'm not here for me. I'm not here for the good life. My life doesn't consist of retiring at age 55 and collecting seashells on the, by the beach. But it's all about this gospel. And this vapor called life is we get lost for the kingdom in advancing it. This one who will stand up to this world and face it, square on with the gospel, he will give his life to advance it. I just want you to hear it. When we go to Africa and we go to Mexico and all these places, when we go to our neighbor next door, he shall be saved. Lose your life for this. And God himself is saying, you will be saved on the last day. Do you want to just get the most toys? Or do you want Jesus at the end of this? Give your life to it. You will be saved. And, and he's going to say it again and again in these next verses. The one who believes in him and gives your life to this, you won't be disappointed. 
You'll never be disappointed to give your life to Kurios, who was raised from the dead for my transgressions. Give your life to Christ. You'll be saved. You're not going to get to the end and get the short end of the stick. You get Christ in all of his fullness with no more sin forever. And the one who plays religion, it's all external, and you are a doctrinal genius. And you just are dressed up so nice in religiosity. You're a secret disciple. Just like boasting of your doctrine, but you'll never share it to anyone who will persecute you. The one who doesn't have a heart for Christ, his place will be where the worm doesn't die and the fire is never quenched. The one who confesses with his mouth and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And just notice that we'll close out where we began. The singular pronoun is you. And so this morning, how close is God? He says he, he comes right near speaking. This gospel has entered this world. Jesus came in and now it's being preached and put right before you. How close? It's right here. And you, you have to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And you'll be saved. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It doesn't say you might be saved. You'll be saved. The one who made heaven and earth says you'll be saved. What could stand against it? So if you've come here this morning and you're just a great moralist who's never been saved, or you're just the greatest of sinners, there's a gospel for you. This ship, this gospel salvation of Jesus Christ will not deny you. It's brought millions to glory and it can bring you this morning. So there's a train of coming. People, get ready. There's no cost. You just get on board through Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And in verse 10, with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth, he confesses resulting in salvation. And so who is this gospel for? The scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. It's, it's the whole world. God's arms are large to the whole world. Whoever will believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. And there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord, Kurios, is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who will call upon him. All who will call just this overflowing mercy and grace to save. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, and we will take that up next week, but I just want you to see the large-heartedness of Christ with this beautiful gospel. And so I think what I, in my own heart this morning with Kurios, is maybe just for the believers, I've called you to Christ if you're an unbeliever, there's salvation in him. And as the believer, just sitting here, is there something that just you won't give to him? You just, this is the one area you don't get. And it's just, his lordship is over all. And to say, Jesus is Lord, it's my Lord. And to just repent this morning before God, that he gets, every, he gets everything. Mine. He, he decla- everything is his. And to just say, God, I give you this. I surrender. I surrender all. That old saying by Hudson Taylor, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And so I I ask and pray, Jesus is Lord. It's more than lips. You're my Lord. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Well, let's pray. And we're going to come to the communion table and see how this salvation is available and how it could be possible to every sinner who will call. And I pray that everyone by faith will look at this table with epinosis and just say, that's my death. That's my Christ. That's, that's blood was shed for me. And it's got my heart. And it's, he's Lord. 
you know, this table is where we come together with faith and believing this truth. So let's, let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this glorious gospel. And I thank you, Lord, that you have opened our eyes to see the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Lord, with our hearts, we believe you raised him from the dead. And it has accomplished our salvation. It's finished. We look to Christ, not by works, but by faith. God, and now our lips own from our hearts. Jesus is Lord. He's seated at the right hand of God. He has a salvation that he's giving to all who will call upon his name. We confess him. We love him. We be our Lord. We serve you. We follow you. We love you. We delight in you, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this table now that we'll look at and remember why our hearts have been taken up with you. Oh, that you would come and die in our place. Lord, I pray let every heart see this. Let every heart be made glad and full this morning with all of their sin as they look upon the one who hung in their place, dying the the fair justice of God for our iniquity. Lord, thank you that you have removed him as far as the east is from the west. God bless our hearts now in believing we do pray. Amen.